Great. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world today. I'm John Kleist. I'm a Sophia evangelist based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States. Pleasure to have with us two uh, folks I've been collaborating extensively with over the past few months who are I have with us uh, Cyril Zimmer of CZ Consulting and uh, Jean-Marc Zucco from AbV Canada. Uh, if you're in America, you may uh, or may not recognize AbV, but they are literally every sixth commercial that you watch. <laughs> if you watch any sporting events, anything, anything, they, uh, you probably are uh, one of the largest companies that you may not have known that you see every day in your life. Um, they're gonna talk a bit about their story with the uh, journey recently with Sophia. And I'm not going to take too much time boring you with my information. I'm going to pass this right on over to Cyril, who's going to provide some introductions and a little more context and talk about some of the recent successes we've had implementing Sophia at AbV Canada. Thanks, Cyril? John. Uh, thanks, John. What a pleasure. Uh, John is uh, has been so kind as to offer to take control of the slides. So I might and tell you, John, if you don't mind uh, to flip over uh, on slide three. Um, so as John mentioned, uh, my name is Cyril Zimmer. I'm the CEO and founder of CZ Consulting, uh, CZ for uh, if you're in uh, the United States. Um, quick story time, I'm a consultant with uh, nearly 20 years experience as an expert in change management specifically. I uh, decided to uh, in 2019 uh, start my own consulting firm. I did so with the uh, simple and humble conviction that change did not need to be complicated to be effective and that people leaders needed better or perhaps maybe the right kind of support to help them navigate through their transformation initiatives. Today, uh, no longer a solopreneur, I now have the extreme pleasure and privilege of leading a sizable and poised team of talented change management professionals uh, who quite simply share the same passion for keeping change simple. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, CZ Consulting, my, my firm, because it's not uh, a spotlight on the firm, but it, it may help you uh, better understand what we've done in collaboration with Abvi. So uh, John, if you don't mind going to, to slide five, um, CZ uh, is a small Canadian-based change management consulting firm. Uh, we help uh, uh, our clients lead projects uh, uh, that have a, a specificity uh, with, with big people challenges. Um, it's no secret that today's workplace has changed. We talk about the pan pandemic uh, a whole bunch, but even before and, and especially after, I think we've got uh, uh, the same sort of trends. Leaders, uh, uh, scope of activities require them to do more with less. Uh, making it a complex proposition. And as mentioned earlier, uh, we, we quite simply believe that change management does not need to be complicated to be effective. Just takes the right kind of skills, expertise to keep things simple. We've helped leaders uh, in over 20 different industries. Uh, we've helped them deliver their transformation projects, optimize their team's performance, and even modernize their, their culture and employer brand. And we continue to empower leaders uh, to make sure change is a success uh, by supporting them not only before the change happens, by making recommendations, but especially during and after their change initiatives. Uh, and because change management is a contact sport, I think the, the true value of expertise isn't just in the delivery of the projects, but the adoption, right? You're asking people to change the way they do things. And as, as we keep that in mind, when we support our clients during their transformation initiatives, um, we're always looking for the best tools, the best frameworks to help us simplify things for our clients and essentially fully leverage their talent. And that's how we sort of came about Sophia. Uh, for those who may not know a whole bunch about Sophia, uh, Sophia is an acronym that stands for Skills Framework uh, for the Information Age. And uh, we've helped uh, that framework, uh, we've helped clients using that framework uh, in, in several organizations. And, and what we've been able to do using Sophia is uh, namely align operating models and process roles with required people capabilities. We've helped them uh, design new roles that didn't exist before. 
uh, validate skills as well and needed to deliver on a new operating model. We help them assess organizational skills gaps, uh, measure current capability and define capability building, uh, and, and even again, create specific role profiles that would fit job descriptions, whether that be to increase visibility and understanding on what they're supposed to be doing, or even leverage that for recruitment purposes. So lots of things that can be done using Sophia, uh, but if I had to uh, sort of dumb it down to, to one thing that I think Sophia does best is building a common language uh, organizational wide, uh, something that we've done with uh, with Jean-Marc's team at Abbey Canada. And uh, while well, I might take this opportunity, Jean-Marc, if you don't mind to pass it over to you so that you can tell us a bit about yourself and, and Abbey and your team. Sure, sure. I, I was just waiting for the baton to be thrown over. John, if you if you could go back to the slide of the, the pictures of, uh, yeah, that one. I, I just want to make sure everybody, you know, I, that, that one gives a really bad impression, I think, of, you know, Cyril's a very happy, go lucky person and, I don't seem to be that at all in this picture, um, but that, that's not actually the case. Uh, you know, these these shots sometimes don't give a good interpretation. So every time I see this, uh, these two pictures side by side, I, I think I've got the the short end of the straw on, on that one. Um, it, it's great to be with with you all. Um, I, I'm based here in in Montreal, in Canada. So uh, good morning or good evening, depending on on where you might be. Um, I'll, I'll quickly you know, give a little bit of, of background uh, of myself and, and of, uh, of Abvi. Uh, so I'm not a typical IT background, I guess. I'll start with that. I actually, I'm, I'm a graduate in political science. Um, so so that tends to get people frowning a little bit of wondering, well, what, why are you in IT then? But that, that's where my, my educational career started. And the joke often is that, yeah, politics and IT, they go well together when you're, you know, talking with the business in different areas. So um, it ha it wasn't quite as uh, misaligned as, as maybe I initially would have thought it was. Uh, I joined Abvi four years ago. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was in retail, FMCG, uh, transportation, food manufacturing, so a lot of different industries. Um, I was in Europe for quite some time, Eastern Europe as well, uh, Australia. So I've had the opportunity um, to work in a lot of different industries and to live in a lot of different places, um, which every time just makes the next role, you know, even better because you're you're taking all of that learning and bringing it forward. And I guess that's where for me the journey with with Abvi became interesting. Um, you know, my predecessor had been here 21 years, uh, and pharma. Uh, is a very internal uh, industry. Uh, so, so bringing somebody from the outside, uh, you know, brought a new perspective. And for me, it brought me just being able to add more understanding to to everything. Um, Abvi as a as a company, uh, you know. So John mentioned it's a big company that not many people know of. Uh, you can see in my background it says Abvi Ten. Uh, Abvi turned ten this year. Uh, we were actually part of Abbott or, or a spin off from the Abbott organization uh, that took place 10 years ago. Um, I don't see those ads, John, all the time because they don't make them into make it to Canada. Uh, the rules here are a little bit different, uh, so we don't get to see those. But I'm glad to hear that we're we're actively uh, visible to everybody in uh, in the US and in other locations uh, as well. If you can jump forward a few just on on. AbV. So our primary focus really of AbV is to, you know, our our line is to make a remarkable impact of the lives of patients. And we often target unmet needs. So we don't, you know, it's not over the counter. It's very specific to support areas around immunology, oncology. Um, you know, so we talk about rheumatoid arthritis. We'll talk about CLL. Uh, so we're really there trying to support uh, patients that in many instances haven't been able to be supported in the way uh, that they really should do. From a, from a BTS perspective, and, and in AbbVie, uh, BTS is Business Technology Solutions, so it's IT. Uh, we just have a, have a slightly different name for it. 
Um, our focus really is on enabling our field force, our marketing teams, our brand teams um, with the tools and technology and data and insights to enhance their interactions with their patients, with the HCP, the healthcare professionals, um, with the government in terms of market access and lobbying, uh, etc. So, um, you know, we're really there enabling all of the, uh, you know, our our colleagues to to interface and interact effectively and more effectively with technology uh, through their their partners. Um, how did we come across and, and what's our journey in, in Sphere? Um, interestingly, this is actually my second time around, uh, you know, and this talks, maybe I've got a lag on the slide, but this just gives a little bit of background uh, as to who we are, but I don't want to spend too, too much time. I'd rather get into the, the journey that we've, uh, that we've started. Uh, as I said, this is our, is my second time around looking at Sphere. Uh, When we were there in terms of helping to define each of the role profiles uh, across the organization to bring some standardization, uh, not just around the accountabilities, but around the skills required to deliver those things. Um, when I then moved to uh, AbbVie, we were really as an organization in a lot of transition. Um, you know, historically, for those that aren't familiar with pharma, uh, think back to whatever digital transformation was in every other industry 10, 15 years ago, uh, and that's where pharma is today. It's a, it's a very, very slow moving uh, industry in that space. Um, so the business were moving and starting to think about digital. Um, and historically within my, my structure, we were all system analysts. So th the connection didn't really work. So what we wanted to look at, and this is where we started to, to work with Cyril and looking at, at Sphere and the Skills TX platform to facilitate that, um, was really to say, well, what are the capabilities that we need to have in place to, uh, you know, to drive and lead the organization in this new digital data evolution? And I say new, and, and again, it's very new pharma rather than new everywhere else, obviously. Uh, so once we define those capabilities, uh, we knew what we wanted to offer, but then we needed to see, do we have the skills in the team to be able to execute against that? Um, so we went through and, and defined uh, the skills as a function that we wanted to have or needed to have to be able to deliver the capabilities to meet the business objective. So we, we went through Sphere. And, and highlighted all of those that were relevant for our organization and at what level we believed we needed to have those at. Um, the phase from there then was able to take all of the roles that we have and individually then say, okay, so if these are the skills that we want as a, as a, a function, how do we then identify the breakdown of those skills into people's roles or not into people's? At that time, it was into roles. So we then define the skills required for each of the roles uh, that we wanted to have within the organization. Um, so at that stage, again, if we keep making connections, we had roles to support capabilities that were supporting business objectives. Um, we then took the next step to assess where were we? Um, so when I joined again four years ago, we were four individuals. We're now 16. So again, not a big uh, IT department. We support 1,100 people in the organization here in Canada, and it's a $1.1 billion company. So quite a big organization, quite a small team to support that. Um, so then we assessed everybody uh, against those skills, again, at both levels, at the functional level and at the individual level. So what I wanted to know was, do we have all of the skills as a function that we require? to be able to enable. Um, and then do the individuals that need to be supporting this, do they have the skills within their own role to move everything ahead? And obviously you find gaps, you know, it's 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 normal. Um, and we were really careful to ensure that we position this not from a, you know, you don't have these skills, therefore you should feel really nervous about your job, not at all. Uh, and that we really needed to start that early because it can be interpreted 
uh, negatively if, if you're not careful. But really to say this is an opportunity to grow and to develop. Um, and, and you're going to be growing and developing in line with what we as an organization are expecting to deliver out to the business. So you're not just suddenly, oh, I'm going to get this the hottest technical training because this is the new trend, but it not, might not be relevant to what as an organization you need or you're striving to become. So we were able really to tie back then the skills from an organization that people had or didn't have. Um, and then from that, build the individual development plans to, to upskill everyone and also to see where as a function we had common common areas of development that were needed that we could then drive functional training to, to elevate everyone. So we uplifted the whole team as well as uplifting individuals uh, in their own capacity. So, you know, that was the biggest change that allowed us to bring these various components. But again, always aligning it back to the business outcomes that were defined and ensuring that we had everything we needed to be able to be successful in leading and driving that. There's subsequent and secondary benefits to all of this as well, um, which we sort of found out along along the way. And the one, you know, was around succession planning. Because we took job descriptions and we standardized them, if you want, um, anyone now within the, the team can see everybody else's job description, you know, and, and they can see the skills required to execute that role. Um, so if you're in a more junior position and you aspire to move into a leadership role, you know, you're able to look at the profile, the job description that's there, the skills that are needed, the level that is required, um, and then you can build your development plan and say, actually, that's where I want to get to. Where are my gaps? And how do I now, over the course of time, fill these, either through trainings or through on-the-job experiences or assignments, whatever it is, to ready yourself to move into those roles? So we're also ensuring that as we promote and move people into new roles that they're they're ready for it or if they're not ready we know where the gaps are that we can then further you know support them to get there rather than promoting somebody to fail in the role that they're going to be because they don't have the skills that they needed to do it so we hadn't really seen that side um, of the use of SFIA at the time but ultimately you know we've been able to align our capabilities to the business, align the skills as a function to the capability, and align individuals' roles and responsibilities to what we need to be enabling and, and moving forward, um, which ultimately benefits the individual, our function, my team, as well as the business in meeting what their objectives are. Uh, and again, had we not had that framework and this fill, the, the sphere, uh, you know, skills and the levels and the definition, we, we would have still been trying to figure all of, all of this stuff out rather than being quite far advanced, you know, within the last 12 to 14 months. So, so you know, that's the, the journey that, that, it's, that we've been on. Um, and, and ultimately, everybody benefits from it, uh, the individual, the team, and the business as a whole from, you know, from being able to leverage a framework that's solid, that's defined, uh, and that's easy to, to navigate and, um, personalize, I guess, to to your organization and your needs around it. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I think you summarized it uh, brilliantly, Jean-Marc. Thank you for that. I'll just add a, a couple of things, and, uh, and Jean-Marc, let me know if it rings true with with action, what happened with with you and your team. Um, one of the key insights that I that we usually share when we do these types of of uh, projects or initiatives with with our clients is that. Um, the focus for most individuals is that they tend to believe that organizations change, and that's a big misconception. I always say organizations don't change. It's the individuals within the organizations that do. And that's really important when you use a framework like Sophia because that has, uh, while it's a very structured approach that we use, then the framework in itself is, is great. Again, I'll go back to some of the important, uh, and I would even say crucial byproducts of using a, a framework and a structure like that one, including the tool uh, provided by Skills TX, is that it helps leaders and managers make it a true success by, first of all, honing in even better on the vision of a team, of the objectives 
of, of their initiatives. Jean-Marc mentioned the importance of sort of seeing the big picture. We talked about business capabilities, but in essence, what that really does is it helps um, Jean-Marc and especially his team better explain to each other, to one another, you know, how to truly become an ambassador of what the the the, the team or or, or the, the the business or the the department um, aims to do right it, it sort of uh, creates a sense of commonality a sense of team around it you can better explain it to it the second uh, outcome may not come is the uh, importance of explaining the roles and responsibilities uh, to the individuals who actually aim to deliver what they're supposed to be delivering, but also, again, amongst the team. I remember Jean-Marc, if you recall, I think one of the, the key symptoms that led to us collaborating together on this and, and ultimately using Sophia was your team members mentioning that they, need, they needed their roles and responsibilities to be a bit clearer, right? And yeah. what was that essentially the problem? I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was more of a symptom than anything else. No, you're right, and it ties back to the the people change, you know, and it, it leads back to where I was saying we we grew within a year from, or within a year and a bit from from four to sixteen. We introduced you know data engineers and data analysts versus and business relationship managers and operational specialists, um, you know. So there's a lot of change and a lot of of movement with everybody coming in with an understanding of the role based on what was written on that paper you yeah. know when you when you look at it at an interview uh and and we now had multiple people playing similar roles but with similar different understandings of what that role was based on everything that they'd done previously um so you're right i think it was a, a symptom of the rapid change within the organization and and the people changing um and it therefore allowed us to clarify um, for everyone, a commonality and a, a level understanding of their roles, but then also ensure that everyone else in the team understood the roles and responsibilities of the other and how they can more effectively uh, work together. Um, so, for, so for sure, uh, you know, it was it was as a result of a lot of this change uh, taking place on that side. I, I think you know your comment that you said, Cyril organizations don't change, people change. You know, I think that's true. I think in our instance, we, we have had an organization that's been changing as well. You know, we made a huge acquisition um, of a business that was completely different to what we knew previously. Um, we introduced new business models. We introduce, you know, new new business ways of working. Still pharma, you know, still the, the traditional, you've got a rep, you go see a doctor type model. Um, but the business mindset was trying to change as well. Um, and that also forced us to reassess where, where were we going to add value? Um, and we weren't going to be adding value by being system analysts anymore. We were being going to be adding value by changing, uh, you know, the conversation and, and the role that we would be there to play. So I think in our instance, yes, there was a lot of the people are changing. Um, but I think also as a business, it was evolving quickly and, and we needed to make sure that we weren't following we're actually ahead of the game to to enable that forward yeah it's, it's a great point and and to your point i think the um we often talk about you know enterprise agility and agility is sort of thrown as a common term that means a whole lot of a whole lot of things and a whole lot of nothing sometimes but i think to your point when organizations change or are forced to, to evolve and change um it, it creates an added level of pressure on the individuals uh, and the expectation is again to do more with less, uh, creating a, a whole so, a whole lot of, of stress, maybe confusion, and that's where I loop it back to using a framework, a common language that can help people work in the same direction. And one of the misconceptions around agility is that you know you're gonna if you do it right, you're gonna work faster and you're gonna work less, which again I think is a misconception. I think. The, the biggest thing around agility that's important, uh, looping it back again to Sophia and what that helps to do is driving meaningful conversations, making sure that people go in the same direction and understand their individual contribution 
to a collective goal. And I think that's what uh, we were able to do. And then again, some byproducts of that are uh, great outcomes in terms of succession planning, in terms of all that. Uh, now, in terms of next sort of steps or next levels that uh, we could push uh, that that framework and that initiative even further is if you wanted to, you know, uh, make create links with uh, other departments like the HR department, having conversations around performance uh, improvement or performance evaluations and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, does it need to go that far? I don't think so. I think the repercussions are felt uh, and in a positive manner already, but I'd be keen to hear you on on where you see the next steps uh, following uh, everything that we've done uh, with your team. Yeah, so so you know you make the you make the reference to to HR, and we have made that link. Um, you know, soft skills are often an area that are, you know, at least from an IT perspective, that are sort of secondary. You know, when you look at the the skills that are identified, it's always you know, around data, you just expect them, you know, can they program Python? Can they do this? Can they do that? It's very technical, but the soft skill element. So that's something that we've had a lot of conversations with HR on in terms of ensuring that we have rounded individuals. You know, they may have a technical background, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be able to do stakeholder engagement, that they shouldn't be able to look at value creation, that they, you know, it, it, it's conversational that, um, you know, we're, we're starting to say IT just isn't technical. There are other aspects of it that we need to ensure we're supporting people to build those skills up. Um, so they've been very supportive around that. As I said, we've been doing some trainings, um, but also, you know, they've supported highlighting and in including these directly in their annual um, goals and objectives to make sure that we're highlighting those uh, for individuals to, to keep growing. So, so we are making that tie back with HR, with our goals, objectives for the year. And actually an overall objective um, is this transformation that we're going through within BTS, within the team, that includes uplifting of people's skills. Um, and, and it's an easy sell because we're tying the need for this and the skills that we require back to the achievement of the business outcomes. You know, we're not doing this for the sake of doing it. We're not upskilling people for them to then leave AppV and go, you know, that might be a consequence, then, then that's fine. But we're doing it because we think this is how we're going to be adding value. And HR are supporting that because they see the longer term value in investing in these things for people moving forward. You know, the other, just briefly, Cyril, before you, you know, you mentioned this, this is one component, you know, how and, and I think what we talked about is, you know, Sphere skills as an IT transformation lever. They've It's been the lever to allow us to ensure we have the skills we need. But, you know, without also working on change management and governance and process optimizations and, you know, all these other components, you know, the transformation, this is one lever. Uh, and it's a very, very important lever because it's the people side of the lever. But we always talk about people, process, technology, you know. So this, great, we're making great strides forward. But if you really want to be transforming, which is what we're saying, we, we can't neglect the other aspects of, of it as well. But we will be more successful in achieving all of those because we'll have individuals that are engaged and understanding, you know, the value they're bringing, that we're investing in them in their future to support what we want, you know, and from, from an outcome uh, at an AbV perspective. So, uh, you know, it is fundamental to, to uh, you know, we talk about work-life balance, we talk about all these new concepts now, you know, people having clarity of their role, understanding where they fit, feeling comfortable with that, um, feeling invested in, um, and not just as executors of things, which is often the perception we may have, you know, just again, from a team perspective that you talked about, really brings everybody together um, to, to move everything forward. So it, it is a key component uh, in that transformation for sure, but there are other levers that we need to pull uh, to be properly successful. 
No, absolutely. And we we alluded to it a bit earlier on 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 the call. But I think doing what we did has a tremendous imp impact and we're probably going to see the the repercussions or impact to the positive impact um, later. But in terms of attraction and retention, so attraction being able to provide uh, better visibility to a new employee as to what he or she is supposed to be doing and how he or she contributes to the realization of the benefits that your team, the BTS team, uh, wants to go uh, in the direction that you want to go. And in terms of re retention, again, you alluded to it, Jean-Marc, uh, but making sure that I as an individual know how I can contribute, uh, there's nothing better in terms of engagement and with the, uh, the, 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 the job market uh, as it is, uh, as competitive as it is, uh, I think more and more organizations uh, try a whole bunch of different things to keep um, employees engaged and motivated. Uh, a lot of, of efforts are being invested in that, and I think it's a very concrete and tactical way uh, you, can, you can address engagement by making sure that individual contribution is clear to the people that you want to keep as part of your team. So can I can I just build on that on that? Of course, of course. You know, and and I think there, there's a couple you mentioned. You know, retain, uh, and, and then you also mentioned the engagement side. So, Abvi, as a as an organization, we participate in the Great Place to Work. Um, you know, and, and where where do we always stand against that? Um, you know, this year again we got certification, but bear in mind. You know what I was saying. We went from four to sixteen of the sixteen roles last year. We had nine because two were promoted, one went on a maternity, etc. Nine new, and despite all of that, of all the functions within AbV Canada, we came up the highest in terms of our great place to work results. You know, so historically, you would have thought you're going through all this change, you're bringing in new people, there'll be uncertainty, you're going to be at the bottom. But I think because of the things you've said, you know, we were clear, we engaged everybody, we gave them a, you know, the opportunity to to define and challenge what the capabilities were, what their roles were, what, you know, it wasn't me saying this is what we're going to do. You know, it was them as a team that were saying this is where we want to go in the future and these are the, what we need and these are is my role within it. I think, you know, it drove a lot of why we were at the top of that level um because we did listen we did engage and we gave people that feeling of you know i'm part of what's what's going on the other example when you mentioned we've done a lot of recruitment but we also you know pull in uh talent from different uh other countries um and we did for the first time use the the, the evaluation as part of that you know so it's the typical hey we've got a talent in this country Canada, you're the biggest market outside of the US. You've got a lot of roles, so we'd like this person to come into that role. Okay, great. You know, I love getting people from different companies and different cultures, etc. So, what role do they want? Well, they want this role. Oh, okay. When why? Well, they need to develop this and they need to develop that and they need to have exposure to this as part of their their future development in the organization. Okay, great. You know, oh, we've just created all of these new profiles using Sphere. Why don't we run an assessment, you know, of this person against the role that they'd like to be coming into? Sounds fantastic. You know, HR loves it. So great. Yes. OK, we'll do that. No problem. So we did it. What did we find? Actually, the role that they'd be coming into was only going to be reinforcing all of the skills that they already had. So then we said, well, let's see obviously a very talented individual, but maybe they'd be better placed in this other role, which is less on the business relationship side and more on the data side, because that's where they seem to not have as many strengths. And if we want to build this leader of the future, let's focus them there. So as a result, they still came over, but now they've come over in a different capacity than what they'd anticipated. And they're actually going to grow more and they're going to bring more value to the team here because we took a few steps and not long steps to actually do that evaluation and say, 
you know, why really are we bringing this individual and is it in their benefit and in my benefit to do this? And it wouldn't have been. We would have made a big mistake because that individual would have probably got quite disengaged, um, not really seen, and we were disrupt, you know, they were moving country, et cetera. Whereas because of that and clarity of the skills, clarity of where they needed to develop and where they could grow and contribute, you know, everybody ends up winning from it. So you're right, from a, a talent acquisition, uh, that whole aspect, you know, it really does give you a lot of opportunity to make sure you're you're really focusing in those areas that is beneficial to everybody. Such such a great example around, to your point, internal mobility today again in larger organizations, uh, is is an integral part of retention, employee retention. So another benefit, uh, absolutely, Jean Marc. I have maybe a, a quick a quick question for you. Going back to because maybe people are are thinking, you know, how long does it take to go through all this uh, through this this process? Uh, again, I think I'll, I'd I'd preface this by saying the approach. I think Jean Marc, correct me if I'm wrong, but was highly collaborative. Right, we involved uh, your team uh, individually. We um, we we preached accountability as well uh, when they did yep. uh, the self assessments. So the question again is, how long does that usually take? How long did it take for you and your team? And 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 to the point of accountability, uh, what were some of the comments or insights that you could share with us? Sure. Um, so so from a timing, th this all started, I'd say probably September, October 2021. So sound, you know, when I'm saying that, I'm sure everybody's going, oh, that's, you know, it's nearly a year and a half and but that was at the point where we actually did our first engagements with the business, you know, with our, and, and I don't like using the business because I know we are part of the business. So with our colleagues in other areas um, to really get a sense of what they were expecting, you know, what was their feedback of their experience and expectations with the BTS organization as it had been and how they wanted to see it moving forward. You know, so that, that on its own took a good, three, four months to, you know, communicate, engage, survey, et cetera. From that point, if I look just at, we, we had a number of work streams, you know, we, so we had strategic objectives, we had a number of different work streams, but if I look at specifically at the roles and responsibility work stream, which is what this tied into, um, within a couple of months, we were, uh, we had the profiles uh, created, um, we had the self-assessments completed, um, and then the longer period was actually the socializing, you know, making sure everybody understood what that meant um, and then building up the plans. Uh, and as of today, we've already done two of the functional wide trainings that were identified as being a priority for the organization. You know, so we're talking weeks, months, not years to be able to get this moving forward. Um, you know, and and again, why was it that way? I, th I think we had proper support. I think if we tried to do this ourselves, obviously you're learning it as you're trying to to execute it as well. So so through the collaboration, we were able, we know what we know and, you know, Cyril and, and his team know what they know. And when you bring it together, you accelerate, you know, everything uh, and, and, and move forward more quickly. Then, you know, the third item in that was the Skills TX platform, um, which again, when we started, we didn't, we took our role profiles, but we quickly took what was already available. You know, th there's pre-formed job profiles with skills defined. So, you know, you can be long and complicated <laughs> if you want, but you can also be quite accelerated in, in this. Uh, and agile to deliver and evolve moving forward. So again, I think we're talking, uh, you know, months. I want to, we're a team of 16, okay? So let, uh, that needs to be in the context of the size of the team that we are on. But again, um, as long as you have the commitment, then, then that needs to happen. Your question around the accountability, this wasn't my transformation, um, you know, and, and, I've said it, so it's not a people know, you know, my, my, I'm not going to be like my predecessor and be here in this role for 20, 20 years. Um, so 
the organization and the capabilities and the skills we were developing were really owned and the accountability to define and own that were delegated down to the team. Um, it wasn't me that was going to say this is what we need. You know, it needed to really become from them because they needed to then own that moving forward. And if we look at the development plans, you know, the self assessments became one on one conversations between the manager, you know, and the employee to say these are where the gaps. How are we going to? And then they did their development plan. Uh, you know, the ladder of I'm here. I want to get to there. Where are my development? All based off the back of the findings that that were there. So they're taking that ownership they're taking that training and development facilitated by the activities we did through sphere through the work with you Cyril and the team uh, and through the platform itself um but yeah if they don't own that then they're not going to be engaged in it and if we're expecting them to then be representing all of that positively when they're engaging with their business partners they, they need to really feel that it is theirs and that there's a benefit there. So it, it full delegation was there. The idea was initiated from the top, but the execution of it, I mean, I think we spoke once every couple of weeks, but you were speaking nearly on a daily basis with the team. And I, and I think that is why we were successful because they really uh, bought into the benefit individually that it would bring them as well as collectively to everybody. Yeah, and collectively, Jean-Marc, if I may, I think uh, one of the things, again, maybe a by byproduct, maybe an outcome altogether, but um, some of the so Jean-Marc's team members shared with me um, the change they, they felt uh, following uh, th that project that, that Jean-Marc uh, led. Uh, which was their feeling of the overall level of maturity of the team that was increased simply by going through the exercise, not the actual outcome or the the capabilities that emerged or the competencies that, that emerged as well from this exercise, but to Jean-Marc's point, the meaningful discussions and conversations they had made them feel like they could ask themselves higher level questions, more strategic questions and um, better serve the organization, not just uh, as 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 great uh, in the execution of the projects uh, that they led, which which they already were very good at executing projects, but being closer to become a strategic enabler, an advisor and, and uh, to to the business. And again, Jean-Marc, I know you said that you didn't like to use the business because you feel like you're part of the business, but before it almost felt as though, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, that you were outside of the business. And now because of those discussions, feel closer to the business that you ever felt before. And I, I, absolutely, I, absolutely right. And and I guess the reason for that is when we, this was a change we were making, um, but we communicated it with the leadership team. You know, we communicated it with their direct reports um, and it's cascaded down in terms of operating models, in terms of engagement models, in terms of, you know, value optimization that we can bring to, to what it was before. So, yeah, I mean, if you look, um, we've probably got about 40 brands within the organization. Um, and previously, again, we were a service provider who were taking orders of build this, do that. Um, we're now on those brand teams, sitting at the table, having the discussions of, you know, what digital and data will bring to them in their, the execution of their imperatives and their main outcomes. So, so the dialogue has completely shifted, um, you know, and, and uh, people, the team feels confident sitting there because they're clear of their role and what they're going to be contributing rather than it being forced, you know, you will sit at this table. Um, it's, it's just aligned everybody much, much more. So, you know, yes, ab absolutely. You know, the type of conversation um, that's taken place, we are now seen as leading and driving the digital and data conversation in the organization, in the affiliate, uh, because we can back that up with the skills and the competencies uh, 
to build that credibility, which is important to to always get. So so for sure, it's it's also changed the dialogue uh, with the with the rest of the organization. But it needed the change management in the communication. You know, it doesn't just happen. Hey, I've got a new role description and these new skills. So make me it, it, it doesn't happen that way. We wouldn't have been able to have those conversations without those to support it. Um, but you need to continue, obviously, with that that engagement. It doesn't come just on the side. Great, thanks, John Mark. I see the the time sort of going by, John. I don't know if uh, we had any questions. I was just questions. about to jump in and uh, so make you aware of the time. Uh, I okay. think you had a couple of slides here that you wanted to to finish up. I don't know if you want to spend a couple of minutes on that, zero before we close up shop and open no, up. No, I, I think we uh, we covered it all. Um, okay. Just wanted to give this opportunity to anybody who wanted to ask questions, if if need be. While, while we're waiting for questions, I'll just. Um, th this. If I look at it and, you know, so my role in, in, in this and I guess, you know, anybody else's role that's that's there. Um, I personally saw this as the key component of my role and responsibility as the leader of the IT function within Canada, you know. Yes, we've got to obviously have systems that operate and, and build and execute effectively. But my main belief, mine, and I'm saying mine because that's not always shared by everybody, is, you know, my responsibility is to make sure that the team has everything that they need from a skill perspective to be successful. And, and that was the starting premise of, of all of this. You know, the changes that were happening, you know, we, we started all these conversations just as we were going into COVID, so we all became remote. You know, so there's always reasons, I think, why it's easy to not go and focus on this stuff and focus on, you know, tins and boxes and applications and ERPs. And um, but but for me, at the end of the day, this is, you know, I always talk about core and commodity. Um, and focusing on things that are core and and not that are deemed commodity and, and tins and boxes for me. Uh, I apologize if there's any infrastructure type people on the call, but tins and boxes for me are a commodity. They need to run, but other people, you can't, um, you can't, yes, you can outsource, but for me, the skills and the internal knowledge and the resources is what I need to make sure is in place for us as an organization to be successful. Um, you know, so it, it's not everybody's focus. It's not where everybody wants to, to, to look because it is not IT-ish to think about these things. But for me, with everything that's changing, with the, the dynamics, with, with, you know, the market, everything, we need to make sure individuals are skilled, not, you know, if it's a benefit to us in Abvi, fantastic. But I think it's our responsibility to make sure that people are growing. And if they end up growing and leaving, OK, that's the risk that you take. But for me, that's my biggest. Um, my biggest responsibility in this organization is to make sure that I've got a team that is uh, competent and moving forward and have the skills that they need to drive everything else. My focus isn't on the tins and the boxes and the, you know, those things. It's what we do in IT. Uh, so I'm focusing more on what we don't normally do in IT and how we do that and the skills component and sphere to support it was, was critical. All right, I got the first question that came in. It says, you've mentioned outsourcing. Do you use Sophia when evaluating your outsourcing vendors? It's a good question. We don't at this stage. We don't. We use it when we're bringing um, in occasionally, and we haven't used it in all instances, when we're bringing in uh, staff augmentation. Um, so occasionally in, in those areas where it's been very specific, but generally, no, we, we don't use it right now to evaluate uh, suppliers uh, as a whole. All right. 
for what it's worth, there's a lot of countries on the other side of the world who have begun to go that route when they're kind of doing the build, upskill, or buy talent approach. There's certainly a business case for Sophia there. The second question I had come in here I said, would you have any recommendations on communications when telling all of your staff they're about to be assessed? Yeah. So first, just so what 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 do we do? I'll, I'll just explain. <laughs> Recommendation won't be. I'll tell you what we, what we did. Um, so so we presented Sphere, um, you know, and we showed everybody, um, and we we were very clear in terms of why we were going down this path, why we were using it, and you know the same way as as a as an IT function, we explain the business value. Uh, you know, the outcome to the business of why we build this app or this. We did the same thing. We articulated the value that it would be bringing to the organization, to the function and to them individually. Um, and while, you know, they'll be hesitant and they'll be I'm not sure about this, you know, we kept reinforcing that same message. And I think the point that Cyril made that they were engaged in every step of the process. You know, so it wasn't, hey, we're going to assess you. Then in six months or in three months, we're going to come back and tell you, you know, where you failed and, you know, that you better get these skills up in the next six months. You know, we, we didn't take that approach at all. We were very, very transparent. We involved them from the beginning. We HR were aware that we were doing this. So if ever they were raised any, you know, concerns, uh, that they could also articulate why uh, this was being done and the value that it was going to be bringing to, to them that way. Um, so I don't think there's a magic formula. There's, you know, I think it's just be transparent about why you're doing it. Uh, and I think the engagement side is what then ensures that they trust that what you're doing is for the reasons you said it was, and you weren't just saying it so that they wouldn't get nervous, but you're actually going to do something else. Um, so for me, that openness and that engagement were the two. So it's less what was said, it's more the way uh, and the continual involvement that then I think uh, changes how they may perceive that. And, and to your point, I mean, um, going back to the word accountability in the assessments, Jean-Marc, correct me if I'm wrong, but we did self-assessments. So the accountability of individuals assessing themselves, I think, goes a long way in the engagement in the initiative where we did things. Yeah, the assessments are all they're all self-assessments when you use the, the tool. So again, you're empowering the individual. Um, and, and then you're having you're not taking actions, you're having a conversation you know, about the outcome of that. And then that conversation will lead to certain, you know, activities, but those activities are again to grow them them. So so you know they keep seeing it's a, it's benefiting them. At the end of the day, right. you know, yes, the business is being benefited because they'll have the skills to deliver more effectively and to engage more effectively, but it it's their own, you know, it's their brand that is benefiting from from all of this at the end of the day. And I think they start seeing that when you engage them in that process. I think you're spot on. Uh, one of the things that I think having uh, Sophia, the way that you guys have done it is it allowed the employee experience team to do their job. Because if you get the buy-in from the individual, their Sophia profile, and let's say you go into independently assess that you're a level six skill proficient project manager, right? You're a level six skill provision project manager wherever you go to work next, right? You're building your skills and your skill inventory at the same time as serving the purposes of the organization, which allows employee experience to say, all right, what can we do to make sure that we keep, maintain, retain these people beyond? Uh, I mean, I joke, but 
98% of the training courses that I've been on in my 20 plus year career, my boss or my own organization told me to go take that class, right? I didn't go into my Sophia profile and be like, all right, I want to be the CIO of AppV Canada 10 years from now. What do I need to do? What do I need to do that? You might not want me to be the CIO already, but that's my goal when I come into the organization. The thing about Sophia is that it allows them to plan that all out and and they'll they'll be able to be CIO of some other pharmaceutical company, if not given the opportunity, but you're right, it brings them, it gives them the skin in the game uh, at the same time as, uh, which is one of the things I really love about Sophia. Well, yeah. we're about out of time. I, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts, Cyril or John Mark. I appreciate you guys taking some time to share your story. And if you're interested in learning more about Sophia or uh, Cyril's, change management, consulting type services, or Jean-Marc is very much a networker too. Uh, we're all on LinkedIn, different social yep. media outlets. Feel free to engage with us anytime. And uh, I'll leave, I don't even have the uh, QR code up here in front of us on our presentation, but it, we at Skills TX, we have a digital skills management maturity assessment. It takes like 10 to 12 minutes uh, that, I will we'll give you 50 plus pages of tailored advice on how to go from uh, one of my favorite things I've learned since working here is that years of experience is scientifically irrelevant in your ability to actually execute a skill or competency, right? So I talk about what do you need to do to transition to a skills-based talent strategy away from I need a cybersecurity engineer with six years of experience. That's not the right way to build out job roles, job descriptions, and appreciate everybody taking their time with us today. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your night. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everybody. And, and do reach out if ever needed. Happy to uh, to follow up on anything. Same right here. On. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much.